address came up to me, put out his fist, and he cr crushed my hand, and he said, greetings to you in the name of the Most High One. Now, when you are in Pakistan, you do not know who is the Most High One. <laughs> now, in the Philippines and USA, you know who is the Most High One, okay? And I waited, and he said, the Lord Jesus Christ. So my brothers and sisters here at GPRO Pastors Trainers Summit uh, in Tagaytay, greetings to you in the name of the Most High One, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a familiar place for me. Uh, much of Topic's history has been uh, defined and formed in the Philippines. In fact, even at uh, CDC, many of you know that I want to deliver spiritual health worldwide. The other uh, uh, words for CDC is Center for Disease Control. We are trying, <laughs> we're trying to have, be a center for spiritual disease control all over the world. So, yes. And to especially be with pastoral trainers. Uh, you have enormous influence with those who have consistent, long-term, proximate uh, contact uh, with God's people. And as a result, it spills over into communities and societies. Your role is a very, very important one. All leaders inspire and move people. All leaders inspire and move people. Whether it is presidents of nations or Hitler, they inspired and moved people. The better leaders influence and mobilize followers. I'm not talking about Facebook followers. This is real followers. But the best leaders, they increase and multiply leaders. So we are together pursuing best leadership practices, not just to inspire and move people, not just to influence and mobilize followers, but to increase and multiply leaders. That's why we are here. I'm grateful that uh, topic in the Philippines is part of a huge human capital campaign to reduce the world deficit of undertrained and isolated pastors by 5% by 2020, which is an important marker moment of this 10-year human capital campaign, which was lo launched in 2010. You might have noticed from the video yesterday two things. One is the launch of topic uh, as an organization right here. Philippines is the birthplace of Topic Worldwide. In Subic Bay. You would also notice that Pastor Philip and myself looked much younger and much more handsome uh, in that uh, video, but uh, don't uh, be alarmed at it. You're all in the same route, okay? <laughs> we are going in the same speed. May not be in the same stride, but at the same rate. So 20 years from now, when your videos are played, you will be just as disappointed as the rest of us. <laughs> I'm grateful for my brother uh, Kuya Philip's work uh, as the national coordinator of the uh, Philippines part of Topic. Thank you, dear brother, for your humble, uh, spiritual, faithful, and excellent leadership as you served uh, uh, Topic in the Philippines. I know that this uh, evening, in a sense, is a very, very large shoes to fill, but uh, my dear brother, Pastor Hill, is going to be the next national facilitator oh. coordinator. And, uh, and I know that God has prepared him all his life. Uh, one of the prayers that you can pray is, Lord, prepare me for the things you prepared for me. He's eternally prepared much for us, Prepare us now, and we can see the fingerprints of God's preparation. I want to thank my brother, Dr. Jason Tan's presentation yesterday. He's becoming a thought leader in the whole movement of non-formal pastoral training. The lanes and lines are not as uh, defined and concretized. It is becoming more and more fluid between formal and non-formal. Then to uh, have my brother, uh, Al Bridges. Al, are you still sleeping? or? You decided to come here. He's not here, Al, are you? Why sleep he in the room when you can sleep here? So Al Bridges is the new global facilitator uh, for Topic. 
and we are very grateful that he is here. He will share a little bit more uh, about the role of topic tomorrow morning in his devotional hour uh, with you. I'm very grateful. We roomed together the last two nights, and uh, another uh, wonderful man that uh, God has brought in commitment to uh, the cause of topic. And uh, as my brother Nixon introduced me, uh, I think he reads my handwriting very, very well to see how great I am. And you did a good job reading it. All right, stories make friends. Stories inspire others. And that's what has been happening over the last uh, uh, 18 hours or so. Here's how it goes. God works through individuals. Individuals work through organizations. And organizations, when they partner together, become movements. God never calls committees, OK? God never gives vision to committees. A friend says he has gone to all the parks, all the central parks all over the world, and he has never found a statue erected to a committee. In reflecting G.K. Chesterton's words, it's always when God gives vision to individuals. But individuals work through mechanisms, organizations, institutions, and so on. And when we work together, it becomes a movement. We do not create movements. We meet the conditions, and God makes movements happen. Don't set your whole life saying, I'm going to make a movement. I'm going to make a movement. They may move you out before you make a movement. So I asked uh, my brother, uh, Pasil, how uh, long I have. I said, what shall I speak about? He said, at least 45 minutes. And the last couple of days, I've been struggling with what I should bring to you uh, this morning. Uh, some of which I hear from you is to have a spiritual feel. Uh, and others say, let's have a strategic feel. And I have been thinking and praying overnight, uh, putting some thoughts together on how we can combine both. And Pastor Phil, yesterday uh, evening, as he prayed for me, uh, he quoted from the scripture that I'm going to use this morning to confirm and validate uh, the direction of this presentation. He did not know that he was doing this, but as the Holy Spirit of God always uh, coalesces, uh, confirms, and directs, I'm grateful for that additional leadership. So if you would put your pl uh, phones on airplane mode and turn with me uh, to the Song of Ascents found in Psalm 133, not just as a slogan. Uh, in Philippines and India, my birthland, were filled with slogans, OK? Uh, but as a presentation and possibly as the framework for what topic might become, especially in the next two years. Psalm 133. I know there are many versions and perversions, uh, including uh, something I heard about last night. Uh, but uh, let's read Psalm 133 by standing in honor of God's word. And then we'll go into the, the message. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, coming down from upon the mountains of Zion. For there, the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. As we begin this morning, I want you to pray a short prayer aloud with me. It says, Lord Jesus, I open my heart and my work to your leadership. Amen. Please be seated. All right, yesterday morning I met with uh, three or four younger pastors, and, and one of them has a basketball ministry, Gerald. And no country is as crazy about basketball as the uh, Philippines. Now, I know boxing is coming way up there because of Mani. My oldest son is a close friend of, of uh, Mani Pacquiao and goes to all his fights. 
And because he's big and handsome, uh, they think he's one of the bodyguards. <laughs> but basketball is a national uh, pathology for the Philippines, right? Everywhere in close places and remote places and villages, always uh, young people playing basketball. I know you watch uh, the NBA. Uh, some time ago, in 1988, during the Olympics, unfortunately, uh, the American basketball team was beaten. And that uh, riled the competitive psyche of the National Basketball Association, saying none of our teams should ever be beaten by some second, third rate country in basketball. And so for 1992, the Barcelona Olympics, they put together a dream team. And these are teams uh, which cannot otherwise come together except for a bigger cause. Magic and Jordan and the bird and uh, airmail, all these guys got together to play for their national team. They just cruised easily into victory. In fact, the opposing teams would stop in the middle of the game to watch their dream players play. After the, the game, they would ask for autographs by the dream team as they dunked balls going into low Earth orbit. And just one handily, there was no question. The whole world said, awesome, awesome, a word that is categorically diluted these days. But then they came to the awards ceremony. And something happened at the awards ceremony that people were aghast at it. The Olympic jacket was made by a particular shoe company. However, the players represented other shoe companies for their commercials and promotions and advertisements. And in their contract, they had committed to never ever wear a jacket made by another opposing shoe company. Now, I don't think the opposing shoe company or the sponsoring shoe companies would have minded if the Dream Team had put together their Olympic jackets. So all these superstars were sitting fully discouraged as to how to handle this huge problem. They were not moving for the, the ceremony. They won the gold. They've given dedication. They've given discipline. They've given duty to their nation. And they're sitting there not able to enjoy what has just been accomplished through their individual egos being subsumed to a greater cause. All because of a few former convictions and contracts. Ah, then somebody came up with a brilliant idea. They said, you can all wear your own sponsoring company jackets, but we're going to bring a large United States flag and cover you. <laughs> now, the United States flag was not... Uh, flying in full mast. It was all messed up and crumpled like going to a dinner toga party. But that common flag kept them together, even though underneath they had their own sponsoring agencies and their own sponsoring companies and their own logos and egos. When it came to the grand finale, Another kingdom took over. 
another flag was waved. And there the world said, awesome again. My dear sisters and brothers, this morning here at GPRO Pastoral Trainer Summit here in the Philippines, I know that we come from different convictions and traditions, different practices and prejudices, different preferences and predispositions. But we've got a bigger flag which covers us. We have a common flag that carries us. And that's what I wish to talk about, a cause which is bigger than any of us by ourselves, but requires all of us so that the world can say, awesome. You know, we can talk about unity in a theoretical way. I can talk about community in an abstraction. But how do you go from theoretical discussion to actual on the ground concrete action? How do we go from concept to execution of unity and community? You have a, a huge historic strategic inflection moment available at the cusp of the 20th anniversary of Topic Philippines and into the future. Because you have a common cause around a common flag. The cause is pastoral health. The flag is church health. Now I don't suspect there is active disunity here. I don't know. The competitive arousal can happen when we are small or when we are big. When we are known or when we are diminished and marginalized. But we've got a cause that's carrying us and a flag that covers us. In Psalm 133, you have the thesis in verse 1 about unity being awesome. In verses 2 and 3, we have uh, two portraits of unity. Unity is awesome. That is the thesis in verse 1. But if you look at the heading, it says it's a song of ascents. This is a set of psalms which were sung uh, annually in their festive occasions. This was the king who was emoting about his people as he saw his people in procession. One time a year they would get to, together and even though all year long they were tribalistic. By the way, I think churches and organizations and institutions can become tribalistic. These 12 tribes would come together for a larger cause under a bigger flag. The psalmist knew how quickly they could divide. They, he knew how quickly they can conquer one another. He knew how quickly there could be bitterness. He knew how quickly there could be pride and arrogance and condescension. But when he saw unity in demonstration, he says it's awesome. Look at verse 1. He uses two sensuous words, how good and how pleasant. These are not the same word. The repetition of the word how says one is not the extension of another word. They're two separate words to capture the sensuality, the attraction, the winsomeness, the impact of unity and community in the middle of diversity and competition. If unity is compared to taste, uh, it is like the Kapang Barako coffee I had yesterday, delicious. If it's compared to sight, it's like Tagay Thai's lake. If it is compared to touch, it's like standing on the beaches of Palawan or 
of barakah in having the water lap up on your feet. If it is compared to sound, it seems like Philippines sing everywhere. Whether they're domestic house helpers in Doha or luggage porters in the airport, they sing in beautiful harmony. If unity is compared to smell, it's like walking through the perfume department of a store and smelling its extravagance and not see sneezing. It's good. It's awesome. It gets people's attention. It makes people take a second look and join and take action. Actually, by using the word good and pleasant, he says unity is in a class of its own. Very few good things are also pleasant, and very few pleasant things are also good. Surgery is good for you, but it's not pleasant if it's needed. The other day, Jason and Donna Tan took me to this boutique restaurant, and they have a dish called heart attack. That dish may be pleasant, but it's not good. <laughs> Unity is both good and pleasant. But where? Everybody knows it's good and pleasant. But where is it good and pleasant? It's in the concrete situation. And he uses a couple of words there. Brothers dwelling together. It's important that you notice the word brothers. He's using a family metaphor here. That the best title known in scripture is brother, so and so. It is not reverend. My people used to call me neverend in India. It is not doctor. It is not bishop or supreme. It's not even pastor. Pastor is not your first name. Pastor is simply a function brother because that shows identity we are brothers we are brothers by blood the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ we are brothers by baptism where he has baptized us in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit of God we are brothers because we are part of the same body we are equal in our sin we are equal at the cross we are equal at the door of the church we are equal in our calling to ministries. We are brothers. Then he said, brothers need to dwell together. Now, I have two other brothers. Several of you have asked me about my younger brother, Rajiv. If you ask me who is the older one, that immediately gives me an advantage. Uh, Rajiv, for those who know him, is not very well right now. He's got a bad back. He can't even walk three steps. So we pray for him. So we were called the Richard brothers when I was growing up in southern India. And inside the house, we would fight. But outside the house, don't you dare touch them. We sometimes call the wretched brothers. <laughs> Inside the house we may have discussion. Inside the house we may have challenges. Inside the house we can have conflict, but outside nobody touches your brother. <coughs> brothers. Dwelling. Sometime I saw a Chinese Kenyan proverb. I say Chinese Kenyan because everything seems to be from China and Kenya and all these places. In one of the offices in Africa, it said, coming together is a beginning. You know this one? Thinking together is progress. Working together is movement, but dwelling together is success. Now, coming together, my brothers and sisters, that's what we've done over the last two days, and you have another day or two to go. Just coming together is a good beginning, but it is not it. If you come together, have a wonderful conference, and go back home, all you had is a delicious party. And we're not in the business of throwing parties. 
thinking together. It began yesterday. And you introduced to concepts, introduced to frameworks, introduced to matrices and toolboxes. That's good to think together. And you are slotting yourself easily into those boxes in the toolkit. But now, today and tomorrow you have to start working together. And that's where the challenge is going to be. We need inputs. The inputs is this GPRO Pastoral Trainer Summit. If this did not happen, we would have not gotten together. There were some convening organizations. We see them listed here, PCC, Topic Philippines, Topic Global, the GPRO Commission, another input are the leaders who are sitting right here, leaders of organizations, institutions, churches, God works through individuals, others. These are the inputs needed for what is going to be implemented. The next column is what may be called the activities column. This is what happens after we started yesterday during these three days together. So uh, how many attendees? 150 to 250, 300 attendees. I'd I don't know how to uh, count very well, but I know that was part of the aspiration. Before the GPRO summit began, attendees were identified. You were invited to come and you were mobilized to come. That's one of Topic's big role, to mobilize trainers and pastors. During the consultation, while we are here, there's praying, there's listening, there is planning. Later today and tomorrow, you will actually come out with plans. So, column number three will be outputs. That takes coordination. During the consultation, you saw a roadmap of next steps. Yesterday there was a call from Bishop Noel for even personal reconciliation. There can be bitterness and envy and jealousy inside the body of Christ. Here is the great conviction we must hold. Our gifts and calling are not creatable. We cannot manufacture them. If we cannot manufacture them, I don't have to be envious of you. If he just distributes them, we rejoice and join. Organizational commitments that you will make. I'm he hearing there could be some sort of a covenant or a manifesto that comes out uh, tomorrow. After the consultation is when everything really starts. We have a conviction at REACH that every event begins the day after. Follow-up begins the day before, every event begins the day after. So this event begins on Thursday. So, though it was a slip of tongue, the Pastor Hill on the first night said, we'll go to Thursday, that's when it really begins, okay? Post-consultation, what is the follow-up action? How do you confirm this covenant? Not everybody who should be here is here. Is that true? How do you uh, distribute it? How do you get others to sign it? And what about assignments of those actions? The ownership of it, the fulfillment of it, the compilation of it, and the reporting of it. So what we're trying to do at a global scale, topic can pursue at a national scale. The fourth column 
will be outcomes. And this is through coalition. Peoples evangelized, churches planted. Did I hear the number 50,000 yesterday? 50,000 churches by 2020, is that what I'm hearing, or 30,000? Total. 50,000 new? 50,000 new churches by 2020. Pastors trained would be 50,000 new pastors trained. Is this correct? Am I hearing this correctly? Please, uh, you can put the numbers in. Believers equipped, witnesses placed, a nation that's blessed. Vision, spiritual blessing of our nation. What is the population of the nation? Okay, reached with the good news of God's Son, the Lord Jesus. Touched by God's Word, the Bible, for personal and congregational growth and health. And the nation changed and influenced towards the values of God's kingdom, internally present and globally future. This is working together. This is dwelling together. So you're not only committing for this conference, this particular week, you're looking at least for the next three years, till the end of 2020, two years till the end of 2020 and beyond. How good and how pleasant, unity is awesome when brothers dwell together. The word together defines unity and community for us. Let me tell you what unity is not. First of all, unity is not uniformity. That every one of us will be thinking the same way all the time. Many of you know that Dr. Billy Graham passed away earlier this year when he and his wife were in a younger stage and age. They asked his wife, do you and your husband agree on everything? And she said, if we agreed on everything, one of us is unnecessary. <laughs> unity is not uniformity. Second, unity is not unanimity. <coughs> there will be discussion because each of you is a leader. There will be ideas. There will be uh, new initiatives. And so topic has a facilitation role. And GPRO gathers you and, and topic facilitates it. It's not unanimity. Oh, by the way, there's one place where there's complete unanimity. It's called the cemetery, the graveyard. Everybody is unanimously agreed that they're dead. There's truth to it, but there's no life to it, literally. Third, unity is not union. And there's a particular health defect called Siamese twins. Have you seen them? Where two heads from the same body and through very, very uh, advanced radical surgery, they separate. Uh, we're not asking for a birth defect. Unity is not unison. So when I heard you sing this morning, everybody was singing, grace is enough in unison, I won't be as rich. Unity is what? The word is found in Job chapter 38, same word, of the angels singing together at creation. It means harmony coalition, solidarity. So we m have to have our logos, hopefully not egos, but we're covered and carried by a larger cause and the ultimate flag. I usually say there needs to be five kinds of alignment inside an organization, including topic. Here they are, five kinds of alignment. First is theology of ministry. I think there's alignment here because you belong to the PCEC. 
Many of you are aware this is uh, just after the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. If you're of evangelical heritage, whether you're Pentecostal or Presbyterian, or on the margins of the evangelical faith, we all hold to five great alones. You know those. What's the first alone? Grace alone. Another one? Christ alone. Another one? Faith alone. Another one? Bible alone. Scripture alone. And finally? God's glory alone. So our theology of ministry, we are already aligned. If you have some problems with those five, then you need to rethink your participation. The second is the philosophy of ministry where there needs to be alignment. And you can have the right theology, but if you don't have the right philosophy of ministry, there will be struggles. Fortunately, we are after a common cause. The training of pastors and the trainers of pastors. Roughly speaking, the GPO takes care of the pastoral leaders, the consumers, to use an illustration. And topic takes care of the businesses, the organizations. The pastoral trainers. Third is what may be called culture of ministry. Topic will have a particular culture. Has some certain processes. A certain uh, policies. They're not tight. They're available for everybody to participate in, but we are in the same culture of ministry. Usually as with people processes, uh, administrative processes, and monies. A fourth alignment of being together is what may be called the strategy for ministry. So when you say the outcome is 50,000 pastor leaders and the output is 5,000 trainers or pastors, that is what I heard yesterday, is that correct? Then you've got to think through what strategy is needed for 5,000 trainers or pastors to be developed and 50,000 pastor leaders to be trained. That's the strategy of ministry. The last one, and usually we put that as the first one, the last one is called the role of ministry. This is where each of us has strengths and each of us has weaknesses. But together we get to fulfill the roles that we have. It may have to do with geography. It may have to do with connections. It may have to do with resources. That's the role we have to play. Oh, by the way, all of it is founded on the sp deeply spirituality of ministry. And that's where most of our battles are inside, not outside. So there needs to be alignment when we are working together. Unity is awesome. I know the world does not know how to treat each other. And the church is bought into the values of the world and do not know how to treat each other. But inside this particular body, it is possible to treat human beings as human beings. As co-workers with God and with each other. All of us strategic, all of us precious, and all of us valuable in God's work. Unity is awesome. But where is it awesome when brothers dwell together? Earlier this morning you prayed, Lord Jesus, open my heart and my work to you. I don't know what God is saying. What new ideas he is birthing. What new steps you need to take. But we are carried by a, a bigger cause and the ultimate flag. Now comes the two portraits. Verse 2 is a portrait from the nation. Verse 3, a portrait from nature. Verse 2, a portrait from the nation, it says, it is, when brothers dwelling together, unity is good and pleasant, when it is like the the moment of the priestly dedication of Aaron. 
Only one time in the history of Israel was the high priest officially publicly dedicated. It is somewhat like a presidential inauguration. I mean, masses of people, all their eyes trained on one person. And what they do at that time in Israel, they take about five quarts of oil, about the same amount of oil that you need for a large car oil change, mix it with fragrant spices, and then they anointed Aaron's head. It went all the way, as you see in verse 2, all the way from his head to the edge of his robes. It also says something about Aaron's beard. They have a legend inside Israel that there were two pearls of oil which stood at Aaron's beard, glistening in the sun. Unity is awesome. Unity is fragrant like the oil of consecration. It's fragrantly pleasant. That's an inversion in the Hebrew. How good and how pleasant? Verse 2 talks about the pleasantness, the fragrant pleasantness of unity and community in the middle of diversity and trouble. The church can be stuck. The church can even stink. Was it Augustine, the church father, who said, if it wasn't for the storm outside, we would not have been able to handle the stench inside. So we heard last night from Bishop Noel, all kinds of challenges Philippines faces right now. Some positive, but the challenges are far disproportionate to anything that we can do. And yet God has placed you here. And somehow there could be a window where you, as GPRO topic, you're showing how pastors can be healthier. Churches can be healthier, and as a result, societies and communities can be healthier. There's a fragrant pleasantness. Unity is awesome. It's fragrantly pleasant like the oil of consecration. Verse 3, unity is awesome. It is fruitfully productive. Like the dew of Hermon. It's like the dew of Hermon coming down on the mountains of Zion. Uh, many of you know Palestinian geography, Israeli geography, Jordanian geography, Lebanese geography. You know the, the mountains are spread all over the place. The center, of course, is the city of Jerusalem. This guy is saying everywhere from the fringes to the center, the dew falls. Unity is like that. It's fruitfully productive. For in the Old Testament, during times of blessings, God would give dew. During times of disobedience, God will withhold we don't have to get into that transactional mentality because His grace is enough. And yet unity is fruitfully productive. When the dew comes, there's fruit and productivity. Do you want fruitful productivity for your congregations, for the church, in the country, in your provinces, in your towns? And Unity. So on Tuesday, uh, they had pastors get together and pray. I was in Japan along with Dr. Jason Tan for GPRO Japan. Somehow coming together is a difficult situation, as you heard last uh, yesterday afternoon. But they want to be fruitful, fruit productive, just coming together. Making plans, working together, dwelling together, you'll be fruitful and productive. But on Tuesday, pastors all over India just got together to start praying. No doctrinal discussion, even though all of them had their convictions. No denominational competition, all of them had their denominations and abominations. <laughs> Only prayer and a cause that was bigger than all of them put together. You have prayer and a cause which will carry you and a flag that covers you. It makes unity fruitfully productive. Yeah. 
there will be a link or something sent to you of an article I wrote about the contemporary global situation. And as you saw in your notes, I was supposed to present the global landscape of pastoral training. It's premised on a very simple thing. Pastoral health affects church health, church health affects societal health. I have four clocks downloaded on my phone. The first is what I'm going to call the reality of people, the world of people. I have a world population clock. Seven point some billion, seven billion. That's a very large number, my brothers and sisters. Very large. Just over a billion minutes have passed from the Lord Jesus till now. Just over two billion minutes from the Old Testament character Moses till now. We're looking at huge, huge needs. So everything we do needs to be scalable. That's why I said the best leaders increase and multiply leaders. That's scalability. You can either be occupied with your church or preoccupied with your church. You want to be occupied with your church but not preoccupied with your church. You want to be preoccupied with the final commission of the Lord Jesus. That's the world of people. The second is the world of the Christian faith. About a third of the world of people, about 2.3 billion, will self-identify as Christians in a census. If you asked, what religion are you? They would say Christian rather than Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, and so on. They are in the World Handbook of Christianity, but not in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is an opportunity. Philippines has large proportions of that group. The better figure we know is not the number of people becoming believers every day, but the number of believers, uh, new believers baptized every day. There is some debate, 178, 180, 186,000 believers, uh, new believers every day. But there's a German researcher by the name of Thomas Schirmacher of the Theological Commission of the World Evangelical Alliance who says there are 50,000 new baptized believers every day. Now think about it. If there's 50,000 new baptized believers every day, you need 1,000 new pastors every day for groups of 50. Somebody said the average church in the Philippines is about uh, 58 or 75. Let's say 50. You need 1,000 new pastoral leaders every day. We'll never catch up. Every school, every institute, every organization doing the maximum and the most. Somehow, this new fruit needs to be preserved. We need shepherds, badly. Functional shepherds. Not necessarily ordained shepherds in Japan. And in the Middle East, only pastors can be ordained. And only ordained people can be pastors. We are in places where the church is growing. We've got to adjust the expectations and the processes and the mechanisms. The world of people, the world of the faith. The third reality is the world of the church. Yesterday, Bishop Noel Pantor talked about this group called the Global Alliance for Church Multiplication. I was with them last year five million faith communities in five years. They said in 2016 to 2020. In 2017, they said they had exceeded the first year church planting initiatives to 1.2 million congregations that they had planted as a group. Now, we are the pastoral training side of the church planting side, okay? Why? Because in April 2013, I was with the same group, and one said, up to 70% of our congregations fail within the first year. How would you like a 70% failure rate for any undertaking within the first year? Would you invest in anything like that? 
So we need sustainability. And that comes through pastoral leaders. That's what you and I are pursuing in our cause under a flag. Scalability, preserving fruit, sustainability. And then, as we heard yesterday, the world of pastoral leaders. 5% trained for pastoral ministry of 2.2 million lower estimates, 3.4 million higher estimates, and there are all kinds of estimates. All we know is there's lots of pastoral leaders who are untrained, undertrained, isolated. We've got to do something. Would anybody go on a flight where the pilot is not trained? Would anybody go to a doctor where the doctor is not trained? There is no other profession which has, has consistent, long-term, close contact with people. No parliamentarian, no president, no prime minister as a pastoral leader. We need to become fruitfully productive. Unity is awesome. It's fragrantly pleasant like the oil of consecration. Fruitfully productive like the dew of Hermon. It says at the end of verse 3, For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. What is the there? Not about Hermon and Zion, but there in the place of unity. The Lord commands the blessing. Life forever. He's not talking about eternal life here. He's talking about vital, vibrant life. If you want your congregations to thrive, your organizations to thrive, your institutions to thrive, your causes to thrive, at the place of unity, God commands blessing. Unity is awesome. But I don't want you to forget the very first word on the psalm. Behold. Some newer versions don't use the word behold, but it's very much part of the text. Behold. Behold is not simply seeing, it is seeing and taking action. He's not saying just look and have a good time, look and enjoy fellowship. He's saying look and join the action. That's the call today. Not only to see, but to act. And the behold is what we call uh, an imperative exclamation, which says, act now, not wait till you get home. That the time for urgency is now. The time for action is now. See, plan, act now. Behold, because unity is awesome. Now, I come from a hot country like you do, so we don't know Winter Olympics very much. We talked about Summer Olympics earlier. Winter Olympics, I don't understand how anybody will do so much in the very desperate situation of bluster and freezing cold. Maybe Al Bridges knows a little bit about it. This was another 
Olympic event. It was a championship of the ice hockey in 1980 in Lake Placid in New York. The Americans were not supposed to be there because the mighty Europeans are the professionals in hockey, the Scandinavians, the Russians. And somehow this upstart, fledgling college team made it to the finals. They're not supposed to be there. It got everybody's attention. They said it was awesome. After church on that Sunday, I still remember going home and turning on the television like all good Christians do after church. And to my total surprise, the game was tied at 3-3. Nobody expected the Americans to do so well with the Russians. And this was their way of trying to handle Cold War realities. We went in the sport. 3 to 3 and everybody's sitting shocked and suddenly the young Americans scored one more it's now 4 to 3 I mean it's a miracle they made a movie called Miracle and suddenly in the shock they are liberated and now the whole stadium is ablaze with patriotic chanting. USA, USA, USA. The Russians are rushing around. That's what they call Russians. <laughs> Desperate for a last moment goal. At that point, the camera of the National Broadcasting Corporation, NBC, focused on the coach of the American team. They all have to stay in little cages. It was a very nasty game filled with human depravity. <laughs> and the coach was pacing up and down his cage, yelling at his players, play your game, play your game, play your game, play your game, play your game. They held on and they won. This is my sisters and brothers. The name of our game, if it can be diminished to just a game, is the church, which needs to be healthy. And the game play that you offer is the health of the pastor. We sit covered by a flag that's the ultimate flag. We are carried by a cause which subsumes all our uniquenesses and differentiators and depraved spirits into saying how can we play our game for the cause unity is awesome at this final moment of my presentation in this mix between exhortation and information. I must uh, mention that I lost my father earlier this year. Yesterday, Dr. Jason Tan brought me a book that he'd written. I took a picture, and when I prayed, I wept. Lived a full life, fragrant, full, and fruitful. 
He wrote a prayer for his family called Prayer for My Family. And it's in the bookmark which will be given to you on your way out. There's enough for each one. Maybe even a couple of extras if you want to take one for your spouses. But start with the one. But the, on the other side is a prayer for ministry that has been put together. I want you to read this slowly, meaningfully. There are actually parts of it which are difficult to pray. I am hoping that uh, you'll identify the parts which are difficult to pray. I'll share with you one part which is difficult for me to pray and then we close together. But let's read this aloud together slowly, deliberately, meaningfully. Lord, I give myself to fully follow you, whatever it may mean. Take every aspect of my life and use me for your purposes to glorify your name. I'm not here on earth to do my own thing, to seek my own fulfillment or my own glory. I'm not here to indulge my flesh, to increase my possessions, to impress people, to be popular, to prove I'm somebody important, or to promote myself. I'm not here to, to, or successful by human standards. I'm here to please you. I'll do anything you want me to do as long as you lead me. Go anywhere you want me to go since you will go with me. And say anything that you want me to say as long as you will fill me. Teach me, guide me, empower me as I climb the ministry mountain. Father, there isn't any gift you have for me I don't want. If you want me to wait to accomplish your work, I will. If you want to use me in a way I'm not used to, I yield myself to that. I trust you, Lord, to do that which I cannot do for myself. Today I affirm my love for you, my God, and I choose to live and minister in your way for the rest of my life. To the glory of the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the health of the church, and the very best of many everywhere, I ask these things. Amen. That second sentence towards the end, if you want to use me in a way that I'm not used to, it's hard for us to pray. It's hard for me to pray. I want you somewhere today, uh, after you get the bookmark, to discuss what you felt uh, was difficult for you to pray and share with a friend. Perhaps somebody you don't know. It would be easier to do that. As you notice at the bottom, we have everything from the navigators to me and some general intercessors and promise keepers uh, who did the uh, Dale Schlafer. They sent it to me and we adjusted a little bit here and there. I want you to pray this prayer regularly, especially in the fact that there is a cause that's bigger than all of us individually and a flag that covers all of us corporately.